and welcome to La Jolla Presbyterian Church's sermon podcast for Sunday, August 12th, 2018. This morning, Reverend Dr. Paul Cunningham is sharing the 11th segment of the summer series on the book of James. The series is called Finding the Balance, Faith That Works, and today's sermon is titled Affluence and Influence. We're looking at the scripture of James, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Please listen after the sermon for a few announcements. You can also learn about what's happening at La Jolla Prez by visiting our website, ljprez.org, or downloading the La Jolla Prez app on your smartphone or tablet, or by contacting the church office at 858-454-0713. And now here's Paul with Affluence and Influence. Uh, So I want to start off this morning by uh, saying thank you. Uh, Some folks have been asking how we uh, ended the fiscal year, because if you know, in May and June, I was up front uh, saying, hey, we're about $100,000 behind where we need to be as we go into the month of May. We made up some of that gap. And then uh, through June, and so um, we didn't quite get all to where we wanted to go, but there's some good news coming nonetheless. Um, We wound about $30,000 short of what our projected giving was, and so that was a little bit bit of a hiccup. Um, We also were a little bit short in some undesignated bequests. We budget a very conservative number of uh, folks who leave legacy gifts to our church, which we are always grateful for, and that number um, was a little bit short this year. But we were also very much um, underspent, and so I'm always, as a finance guy, I always like to see when we're underspent. So when all is said and done, at the end of the fiscal year, we were about eight or $9,000 short. Um, so that's, that's pretty good news. And, and I say that's good news because also during this year, actually during the, these first six months, we have also raised or had pledged an additional $350,000 um, to finish paying off this. Because if you remember our Creative for Community campaign, we did this, we did the courtyard, and also our children's wing. And so our anticipation, we owe about $390,000 on our note. And so we anticipate by the end of December to have that thing completely paid off. So um, thank you. I want to say thank you. That was great. You all can applaud for that. I think that's... Very well done. We are grateful uh, for your generosity that allows us to continue in our mission and ministry. Our elders adopted a very flat budget, so we anticipate kind of being in the same, uh, spending the same amount of money, doing the same things, and we're excited about that. So thank you for that. I also want to kind of line out uh, what the next several weeks are going to look like, because I know sometimes, I'm sure you all are very concerned about that, right, of what's going to be happening week in and week out. Um, So just in case if you're not concerned, you're going to get to hear this anyway. But uh, next Sunday, Stan's going to be taking a look at uh, perseverance in James, the second part of James 5. When you hear the first part of James 5, if you haven't listened to it yet, I wonder to myself, why didn't I let Stan preach the text for today? Um, And you'll understand that in just a moment, I think. So anyway, Stan's going to lead us through that. The following Sunday, the last Sunday of August, um, Reverend Carla Shaw, who is the head of staff at Uh, Point Loma Community Presbyterian Church has asked me to come down and share the story of urban life with her congregation, of how we launched that ministry in City Heights in southeast San Diego. And so I said, I'm glad to do that, Carla, but you're going to come and preach for me. So um, we're delighted that Carla Shaw will be with us. She's a phenomenal communicator, and it's going to be great to have her uh, with us then. We will wrap up the book of James on Labor Day weekend on that Sunday. And then in the fall, we're going to start a new sermon series on the theme of engagement. Um, What does it mean to engage with God? What does it mean to engage with community? Uh, What does it mean to engage in our own congregation? And so I'm really looking forward to that. I'm not sure how many of you were here last Sunday uh, to hear uh, Tyler Whitman, who's one of our uh, summer interns, preach. He did a great job. I was like, man, when I was 20 years old, I could never have done that. I don't, I mean, he just did a great job, and as I, as I was listening to him and, and his articulation of the story of the prodigal son, um, I, what I thought was great, too, was, was as he looked at the image of the, the older brother and how sometimes we forget what it is to be blessed when we are in the midst of the kingdom of God. That if you think about the, the struggle of the older brother, he was in the father's presence his whole life, and yet he never realized the blessing that came with that. And as we think about the story and the text that we're going to be looking at, actually as we think about the entire, uh, the entire letter of James, there is this sense that what James is writing about as he writes this church, he's writing to a church saying, 
what's happening to you? You had this original love, this original passion for Jesus. But over time, that has waned. And and reading through the book of James, preaching through the book of James is difficult because when there's 110 verses and 60 of those are in the imperative voice, it's very hard to soften that message. Because James basically just points the finger at the congregation and says, you need to get it right. Um, And and if you're reading through that, or even as I've been preaching, I'm sure it's a little offensive, um, how James writes that and what it is that he has to say and how he kind of calls the, uh, the congregation to task. But one of the things that's really important for us to remember is that James, in the beginning of his life, remember, James is the half-brother of Jesus, right? We, we haven't gone back and talked about this for a while, but, but sometimes as we get in this sermon series, we kind of forget that, oh, yeah, James, he grew up with Jesus as his older brother, um, talk about a terrible situation, right? I mean, to have the Prince of Peace and the King of Glory and all those other sorts of things, that's your big brother. So, so he grew up, and, and as we talked about, you know, his family didn't believe Jesus. They scoffed at him. They said, this man is crazy. Jesus, you need to come home with us. Quit, being, quit going out there and preaching and teaching, all those sorts of things. But then something incredible happened, and the Apostle Paul writes about that, and that's what's going to um, kind of set our tone uh, for this morning, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and, and Paul just as he's writing his thank yous and, and kind of getting everything else out there, he says this, for, I received, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So he just recounts this story. And then he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he drops this line. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared also to me as to one abnormally born. So if you were here, and if you remember when we began this sermon series on Memorial Day weekend, We looked at that text and said, do you understand what happened to James? Here was someone who doubted his brother, who he was, his authenticity, everything else about him claiming to be the son of God. He doubted him his whole life. And then after the resurrection, Jesus shows up. And he goes to see his brother James. And everything changes. James' life is completely transformed by this encounter with Jesus. And as James writes this letter, he writes in the sense of saying, don't forget about this. It's the idea of Ephesus, the church in Ephesus in Revelation, where, uh, where John or Jesus says through, the, through John saying, you've forgotten your first love. And so the same sort of thing is happening as we've been reading through James. It's kind of just wake up, wake up, wake up. Let's get this right. Let's figure this out. So this morning, the same sort of thing's happening. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And I would invite you to pray with me first. God, thanks for this morning. Um, Thanks for yet another difficult word. But it's a word that also brings encouragement to us. For Lord, as we think about our affluence, we also need to think about our influence. Because God, you have blessed us in so many ways and you allow us. Lord, not just to use our affluence, but also to use our influence to make a difference in this kingdom. Because Jesus told us the kingdom of God is at hand, and so that means for us that that we live into that kingdom. So help us to know how to do that well. How to take this challenging word of James and to see in it a reminder about how we need to allow Jesus to influence our lives, to change our lives. Lord, guide us and lead us as we hear this word. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so here we go. Now listen, rich, you rich people, weep and wail because of your mis- the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. 
You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Don't you think Stan should have got to preach on this text? <laughs> what a great text to come back from vacation, right? I mean, ah, oh, just like relaxing vacation and boom. You know, the scholars at times have tried to say, well, James really isn't talking to the church here. That who he's really going after are, are those who aren't believers or those who are calloused in their faith. And, and, and we just can't make that argument. But what James, I think, is, in, in his own unique sort of way, in his own kind of lecturing way, I mean, James, you know, he's Jewish. He's, he, he writes like you read the Proverbs. There, there's wisdom in, in what he says, and there are these short p- statements that he makes about how it is that we as followers of Jesus ought to be living and he's done this already. I mean, he's already talked about money. And you may remember, I'm, I don't even remember when I preached about this, but I preached about it at some point because in James chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, this is what he says. Um, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls, its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. I mean, can you be, can you imagine like sitting in the pews and and this is what, you know, the pastor, whoever it is, gets up and they just start laying out the truth that James has to say? And it, I mean, we're already uncomfortable just because of the heat. I recognize that. And now you're like, great, Paul, I'm sweating to death. And now you're going to sit here and talk about money. And I'm not, I am going to talk about money, but I want to do it in a way that I hope is helpful for us. I, I don't want to soften what it is that James is saying. But I think every time we read scripture, we have, a, we have the opportunity to be challenged, um, but also encouraged. And so that's what we want to kind of consider this morning is, is how affluence and influence can actually work together. Because the danger of affluence is that we can begin to live lives where we think we are privileged, where we think we have certain rights. Affluence can lead to privilege. And if you read through what it is that James is saying in this text, it's really an indictment on the church and people in that church who were living privileged lives. It's not so much about the money, and it's not so much about the wealth, but it is about what do we do with that. And I want to be very clear about that. You know, when Paul writes to Timothy, he he doesn't say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. He says it is the love of money that causes all kinds of trouble. And so what James says is he says, you're hoarding. You're holding on to. You're clenching on to it too tightly. And, and Jesus, as we know, talked about this dilemma as well. Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 16 through 21. It's the parable that Jesus tells of the, the foolish rich man. And he says, he, Jesus told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger barns. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with whoever, and the word used here is stores, but it's the same Greek word that James uses for, that is translated hoards. For anyone who hoards up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. We have an issue with hoarding. Now, what's interesting to me, though, is our perspective on hoarding. Um, I I think there's like some reality TV show on E or H, I don't know, one of those crazy stations that's called Hoarders, right? 
I won't ask how many of you have actually watched the show, but, but the, the show is basically, I, I haven't watched the show, but the, the, I'm pretty sure I can guess the theme of the show because I'm sure you walk into someone's stuff, house who is hoarded, and you may have people like this in your family. You may be one of those people. I don't know, but, but they're hoarders. They've got all this stuff, and they accumulate, and they accumulate, and they accumulate, and, and the show, you know, we kind of mock that, right, these people who hoard But the irony of our society is we mock the people who hoard stuff, but we are envious of the people who figure out how to store, quote unquote, hoard money. It's one thing to have a bunch of stuff lying around on your floor, right, in your house, but if you figure out how to store money and wealth, that's a whole different story. And so James is saying, be careful. He's not saying don't save your money. There's something wrong with saving it. He's saying don't hoard it. I don't know if you taught your kids this or, you know, with our kids. We've, we've always said to our kids, here's the way we want to live. Here's, here's, here's where you start. Of all that you bring in, you save 10%, God gets 10%, and you live on the rest. And when our kids were younger, they had these little, well, they weren't piggy banks, but they were some sort of bank that had three different rows. So we could literally say to them, hey, you get a dollar, we figure out how you split that up. God gets 10%, you save 10%, and you can spend the rest. Because if we're not taught that at some point in our lives, it's easy to fall into what happens in our own society, and that is that we're always reaching for a little bit more. But what our goal ought to be is as we continue to earn more, we ought to be giving more away. Not hoarding, not building bigger barns, but figuring out how we live more generously. Because what James is ultimately saying is if we cling too tightly, we will end up rotting our souls He says there's corrosion, there's rot, these things disappear. So be very careful. And what that means for our lives is is we need to think about that. We need to think about the ways in which God has blessed us. It's not saying we can't go on vacations. It's not saying we can't save some of it. But when we plan our vacations or we plan our major purchases and somehow we leave God out of the equation, then we have to be careful. And I know some people in here, you want me to give you a number or give you a percentage or give you all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to do that. Because I think that's the thing that you and God have to sort through. But James is saying to that early church, come on, folks. Think about what's happening. Think about where your heart is going. We've talked about this a number of times. And, and, and years ago when, I, when God finally hit me over the head with this passage that Jesus you know, talks about where he says, um, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And I realized that early on in my life I had it all wrong. I thought if I captured people's hearts, what would follow? That's not a tr- I know you all are very tired and it's warm out there and you're like, please don't give us a trick question because it's just too hot to even think. That, that's not a trick question. It says, you, you, I'm like, I capture your heart, your treasure is going to follow. And remarkably, Jesus said, Paul, you're wrong. Because Jesus says, whatever you treasure, whatever you value, whatever you hold is ultimate, your heart's going to follow. Your heart's going in that direction. That's why we know with this issue of idolatry, that's why we have to be so careful because Jesus is getting, and what he's really driving at is saying, it's an issue of idolatry. Whatever you value, your heart's going to follow. If you value the things of God, your heart's going to follow. If you value the things of the world, your heart's going to follow. 
If you give to this group or you give to that group, your heart's going to think about that. Think about the organizations you give to. Your heart follows them because you want to know what's going on. And you get really frustrated when you give to some group, organization, or whatever, and you never hear anything back. You don't know what's going on in the mission or the ministry. Because your heart follows. And so James is saying, church, let's be careful. And and unfortunately, he doesn't just end at verse 1, 2, or 3. He kind of just keeps hammering on this point. Until he continues, and then he goes on and says, be careful how you treat those who are less privileged than you. Because remember, we said there's a, the, the issue in all this is the issue of privilege. And he says, consider the people who are working for you. This is now, he's talking to the people in the church and saying there's others who are working for you, and you're robbing them, you're cheating them, you're depriving them, you're not paying them. What an awful witness of the kingdom of God to claim that you are a Christ follower and then to be ripping off your employees. And not treating them fairly, not treating them generously. Leviticus 19.13 says this, Do not defraud your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. What Leviticus 19 is saying is make sure if the least of these work for you, you take care of them. You don't hold back. All right, you guys ready to change a little bit? Move from affluence to influence maybe? No one's ready for that? I'm kind of ready for that. I don't know about you, but I'm hot up here. Um, By the way, just in case you're wondering, if anyone just would like to write a check for $75,000 today, we can get air conditioning in this place. So uh, just it's true. God honest truth. I asked Roy, how much does it really take to get air conditioning in this place? So part of the good thing we did when we did all this renovation, we actually ran a bunch of piping over here already. So we made some considerable progress on that. So anyway, just, just a little FYI there. And a little, bring a little levity here to, the, to the, uh, this idea. So if you look at verse 5, um, and verse 5 is a scathing, scathing verse as well. But, but I'm like, but how do we flip that? Because I think that that's, you know, James can point the finger and blast the church and say all these things. But I think it also, if we can flip it, it gives us an idea of what are we, what, what, what are we to be aiming for? And that's kind of where I want to move now. He says in verse 5, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. So he's basically, he, he's now talking about eschatology. He's talking about the end of times. And he says, you know, this day is coming. But, but I think this idea where he says, you know, you've lived in luxury and self-indulgence. And what I think as I read that verse, I think, well, what happens, though, if we don't live like that? If we quit being self-indulgent? If we start thinking about, Lord, how do we use our affluence and our influence to make a difference in the kingdom of God? Because the previous verse says when we don't pay on time, when we don't show generosity to those who work around us or who work for us, there is this cry that goes up to God. We may not hear it, but God hears it. So how do we use affluence and influence? And, and it's something that, that I'm not sure we always think about. So I was, we were, uh, Shannon and I were away this last week, this last Sunday. Um, we have a covenant group, as I probably have shared with you before. We have eight couples who all met about 25 years ago. Uh, we get together every first weekend of August for a long weekend. I talk about life, talk about what's happening in our lives. It's an amazing group. I don't, I mean, just to have that group of friends that we've known for so long. And a buddy and I um, in in that group, he and I have known each other actually since middle school and went to the same college, went to Princeton together and have just known each other. And and everyone had kind of left and they were off doing something. So he and I were just uh, sitting around and we start talking about this theme, although it wasn't, it was not necessarily with these words, but the theme was around influence and affluence. And, and, and maybe this is what happens when you turn 50. I don't know. I'm not sure I would have had this conversation in my 40s. But now both of us are in our 50s. And, and we're having that conversation, though, around our kids. And of saying, you know, we've parented our kids, you know, most all the way up through their teenage years. But we're not done yet. And the way we parent will change 
But this important of, I mean, he's up in Ojai, so he's in a very, you know, affluent sort of community like us down here. And, and, and there's this sense of saying, how do we help our children understand not only their affluence and their privilege, but also their influence, the difference that they can make because who God has made them to be? How do we teach them and continue to teach them about living selflessly, about not being indulgent, about figuring out how they will leverage their own affluence and their own influence? Because I really don't feel like for Shannon and me, our job is done. I mean, it's like when they go to college, everything is done for us parenting our kids. But how then do we talk to them about these issues? Because I am convinced, and I've said this before, that if we don't live generously, and I don't mean just giving finances when I'm saying this, if we don't figure out generosity, we're never going to know God's joy and peace. If we can't figure out how to be generous people with time, with resources, we're not going to know joy. And I can see that in my own life. I mean, I've readily admitted to this group before, right? I am half Scots Irish, I am quarter Armenian, I am tight, right? I'm cheap. My wife just nods her head and says, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but I will tell you, in those times, in those moments, when I'm generous, with, whether that's money or time, because time is also an issue for me. But in those moments, when I let go and I let God's generosity pour through me and out of me, I experience the most peace and joy And so if we don't get, I mean, we may not like the way James is talking, but he's really driving at saying, let's consider generosity. Let's consider what it looks like to live generously so that we can know joy. Because otherwise, and now back to James again, just as I kind of bring you up again, I got to bring you back down again. I apologize for that. But otherwise, we get to verse 6. In verse 6, verse 6 is the worst. I mean, if you haven't think, and you probably just skimmed right over verse 6 because you're like, oh, man, this is already terrible. I stopped listening at verse 1. You know, you rich, wealthy people, yeah, 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 boom, 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 boom. Um, and then verse 6, he says this, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. In living like this, in not stewarding your resources well, in depriving other people, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one. Now, this is, the, this is where scholars and Bible translators get all caught up in who is James talking about here? Because some translations you can go and you can read, you, you, uh, you condemn and murder the innocent ones. They make it plural because then it's a lot easier to say, oh, you're condemning and murdering these innocent people who are working for you, who you are depriving. You can go check this out. It, it's, I mean, they're actually one of the commentaries I read makes it plural. But the Greek language is singular. You have condemned the innocent one. The one who could have chosen to condemn you but chose not to condemn you. He is saying, do you understand what you are doing if you do not live generously, if you do not live gratefully, you are condemning Jesus Christ. You're putting him right back up on the cross again. Ugh, man. We don't want to do that. We don't want to condemn the innocent one, because the innocent one, th this is why it's so important to understand that the innocent one is Jesus himself, because what James is saying is, do you remember, do you, do you know what Christ has done for you? He brought the riches of heaven down here to earth. He lived amongst you. He gave his life for you so that you might have joy, so that you might have peace, so that you might have influence. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell the same story of the rich young ruler who rolls up to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? You better be careful when you ask that question of Jesus. Because for the rich young ruler, Jesus said, you have to go and sell everything and then come and follow me. But in that moment, you don't just have one rich young ruler, you have two rich young rulers. Because you also have the one who is king of kings and lord of lords. The one who brings the riches of heaven down to earth. The one who says, I want for you to follow me. And the earthly, rich, young ruler walks away sad. I don't want that to be our story. I don't think that's our story. I don't believe that that is our story. And I think about this congregation. I think about the influence that this congregation has had on so many people. Some of it's related to affluence, but much of it is not. Because affluence isn't always just the affluence that that we think of in terms of using our money. It's this affluence of gifting and affluence of passion that we have been given. I I was thinking about that, and then actually as I was working on my sermon this morning, I I thought to myself, 12 years ago, next Sunday, I preached my first sermon at La Jolla Press which to me is unbelievable. But I think about what you all have done. And that's just 12 years of the 100 and, what are we at now? 115 or 14, somewhere in there, that we've been around since 1905, whatever, there, 113. But I think about that, and I think about some of the stories that I get to hear that you all don't always get to hear. The lives that are changed. The way in which you impact people. The way in which you use your affluence, but also your influence. I got an email this week from uh, some folks who are involved in Interface Shelter at our church. You may recall twice, uh, two weeks out of every year we host uh, folks who are homeless or emerging out of homelessness. Folks who have come in as asylum seekers. Folks who have come in in just distressed sorts of situations. And, and just this week... Some of our folks were key in helping one of the people who actually stayed with us, who was an asylum seeker from an African country and just was in a horrendous sort of a situation. They had walked through this path with her where she actually had her ankle bracelet removed this last week because she followed through the system and people in our church walked that path with her so that she could experience freedom for the first time after she fled from this war-torn nation of hers. This is influence. Several weeks ago, if you might have been here, Ron Bowles, who is our director of worship and arts, uh, brought in the San Diego Street Choir to come and sing and, and, and share, you know, the story and, and, and what God is doing and to hear their voices. Well, one of the stories I heard that we didn't really share was one of the guys in the street choir said to Ron, I cannot believe how nice the people at La Jolla Press are. They went out of their way to welcome me. To I can't tell you one of my proudest moments was sitting here and watching 10 or 15 people walk up to them and welcome them to worship on a Sunday morning. But this guy said, I want to move to La Jolla. He said, I'm moving out of downtown. I don't want to live on the streets in downtown. I want to move to La Jolla because those people are nice. And they talk to me and they welcome me. What an incredible testimony. But you know what? Most people will never hear that story. But it's your influence. As I shared earlier, I'm going down to Point Loma Press to preach in two weeks for Carla to talk about the story of urban life. The reason she wants me to talk about that story is because she was at our presbytery meeting a year or so ago when Sarah Carter and I shared that story. But I shared a part of the story that most people don't remember when we started Urban Life. For those of you who don't know Urban Life, it's this inner city ministry that we began about eight or nine years ago, maybe 10 or 11 years ago now, that ministers to students in City Heights in southeast San Diego. What I told the Presbytery is that what most people don't remember is when we made that leap of faith to start Urban Life, we were four and a half million dollars in debt. And people are like, what? You guys were in, when we, were, we owed four and a half million dollars on the Family Life Center and everything that was built around that. And yet, what did our elders decide to do? They said, you know what? 
It's not all about affluence. It's also about influence. And so they took this huge step of faith. They would not let fear have the last word. That's why I love this church. Because I think for us that when we bring together affluence and influence, we can make an incredible difference in our community and our world, in our own society. So let's think about that. Even though James kind of points the finger at us, let's think about what's he really trying to get at? It's kind of getting us to think about our priorities. What gets our affluence? What gets our influence? And let's figure out ways to use both of those for the sake of the kingdom of God. Pray with me, please. Lord, help us to leverage the affluence and influence you give to us. Lord, we recognize we are a privileged group. And a lot of us have worked really hard to get to where we are. But that's not the end. Lord, if we're not using our resources and our talents well, if we're just hoarding them and not using them for the sake of your kingdom, we're really missing out. So God, would you remind us of the importance of generosity? that we might be a joy-filled and peace-filled people. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for listening. Here's some of what's happening here at La Jolla Press. La Jolla Press is still collecting blankets, sleeping bags, towels, non-perishable food, and baby gear for asylum seekers. Please bring these items to the church this week. For more information, please email Christy at czakin at me.com. That's C-Z-A-T-K-I-N at me.com. If you are interested in working directly with a family, go to safeharbors.net. The annual used book sale fundraiser will be Sunday, September 30th in the courtyard. This is a great way to share the gift of books and to serve by helping with the book sale. Please drop off your used books ASAP at the reception desk or contact Edith Bryant Aguilar at edithbryantaguilar at gmail.com to assist before, during, or after the sale. You can find a complete listing of what's going on around La Jolla Press on our website at ljpress.org. That's L-J-P-R-E-S dot O-R-G. We'll call the church office at 858-454-0713. We hope you have a wonderful week full of many blessings and we hope to see you soon.